I'm going to ask everyone to uh, put down your notebooks and close up your computers for a second. Stand up with me. We've had a long conference. We've had a long day. We're going to stretch out a little bit. All right, and we're actually going to enact out part of an algorithm. All right, you've just been born into the world. You're a stick man or you're a stick woman. You exist in this random place in this universe. I'm going to explain the algorithm to you, and then we're going to then we're going to start it. Okay? You're going to pick a random location in the world that you can walk to. You're going to walk towards that location. When you reach that location, you're going to pick another random location in the world that you can walk to, and you're going to start walking to that location. When I clap my hands, you're going to look around you and find the nearest stick person. You're going to head towards them, and when you reach them, you're going to play, okay? So in stick world, playing is just raising your hand and going back and forth like that. Everyone try that so you know what it is. <laughs> I have a quick question. Sure. What if we bump into another figure while we're randomly? <laughs> Please try not to do that. <laughs> in the virtual world, that doesn't matter, but in the real world, you might get hurt. <clears throat> okay, so everyone, just to recap, you're gonna pick a random location in the world. You're gonna to walk towards that location. When you reach that location, you'll pick another random location. When I clap my hands, I'm changing your state, okay? And you're gonna look for the closest stick person, walk towards them, and when you meet them, you're gonna start playing, okay? Ready? Everyone got a location in their head? Okay, start. <laughs> that was not one. <laughs> Everyone should still be walking. If you reach your first location, you pick another one. Okay, everyone change your state. Find the closest stick person. Walk towards them. Your stick person. All right. That's it. Thank you for indulging me. You can rest your seats. That's good. Okay, this is this is the Society of Stick People. This is a real-time interactive installation. Um, that I consider uh, in an art context. So I'll, I'll be installing this in a gallery uh, for a group show coming up at the end of May. It's gonna be running continuously in the gallery space with some other conceptual artwork. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so this is something that I've been working on for a little while, uh, off and on over the years. And I'll just uh, let you watch it for a little bit and then I'll, then I'll talk about it a little more. Have you thought about birds or fish and tree <laughs> randomly? Sure, as you'll see, there are many, many possibilities for this entering into other places. Okay, so now everyone, everyone realizes why you know I enacted that part of the algorithm for you. Or rather, you enacted it for me. Uh, Okay, so in this particular version of the Society of Stick People, uh, my goal is to, besides enjoying the dynamics of a population simulation and a simple finite state machine, my goal is to start to ask questions and, and, and generate discussion around the idea of sustainability. Um, hot topic, you know, all around the world, people are uh, I should say, in the United States, we're starting to catch up with our awareness of our uh, role in destroying things with the way that we build and the way that we, um, you know, leave things behind and, and all these types of issues. So, in this in this world, um, all the stick people that are in the world right now are, are building, quote unquote, sustainably. So they're building these uh, structures, these dome structures that already exist. And you see that the dome structures have gold um, girders, so to speak. 
And that's what signifies, in this world, that's what signifies a sustainably built dome. Now, the, interaction, the interactive part of this, uh, if this was set up in a gallery space, um, I have the keyboard here, and, it's, and I'm just going to kind of explain. You're going to have to use your imagination a little bit. So there's one button, and it's going to insert people, stick people, little stick babies back there in the universe. Okay, so, so one button inserts sustainably acting stick people in the universe. So these stick people, as they use the resources and as they build, um, are going to continue to build the gold domes. They're going to continue to build in a way that's, um, you know, that's good. And, and as, I, as I think about this conceptually and bring it back to our world, I think, okay, sustainable practices have to do with the way that we gather our resources. It has to do has to do with the way that we use our resources. It has to do with the types of things we built and the way that we build them. And all of these results in, uh, in this landscape that uh, has an imprint of our activities and our lives as a society. Uh, so viewers number one through 10 have come up and they've inserted some sustainable stick people in the universe. Now somebody else comes up and they're gonna insert some unsustainably acting stick people. You'll notice that there's nothing visually different about them. It's only manifest in their actions. Um, and this is, this is important to me. I feel like uh, each of us has the ca uh, capacity for great good and great evil. And it uh, really boils down to a matter of choice. Choice on a daily basis, choice on an individual basis, and the collective, um, you know, the, the, the gathering of all of our choices into movements and into the possibility of change. So um, as those stick babies grow up, they're going to start building. And you'll see that the buildings that they build are going to darken, and they're going to turn uh, black. So the girders will be black. And uh, at this point, I'm going to actually rotate the camera for you a little bit. So you can see the contrast. At this point, the um, it's, it's relatively simple in terms of the simulation. The, the buildings that are built unsustainably decay more quickly. So as the, stick, as the society dies off uh, and you're left with a landscape of, of variously gold and black buildings and you continue to watch the simulation, um, the black buildings will, will shrink faster, noticeably faster. Um, and that's, this, is not, you know, this is not a direct one-to-one -one correspondence between the metaphor and reality. Uh, I think we can build unsustainably and have things that are lasting, you know, long into the future, but in a harmful way. So it's, it's just a, it's, it's an abstraction of an idea meant to elicit conversation and, um, you know, bring up discussion. So this is, this is one project that I've been working on um, off and on for the last couple of years. I know it's fun to watch, but I'm going to stop it and keep on going. All right, so I just want to say thanks to United Arts of Central Florida because they gave me some grant money, and it's important for me to say thank you for that. Let's see if we can. All right, here we go. So you'll see. That's just in case the program didn't run, but over on my notes page is just kind of some of my idea generation process. This, I, I look at this as um, having a basis somewhat in, in conceptual art. So I, I'm exploring ideas on paper. I'm thinking about algorithms. I'm thinking about structures and systems that I'd like to explore and their ties to uh, my life or their ties to the world around me. And I'm thinking about uh, how can I represent this in a virtual space, in, a, in an artistic context, in an aesthetic context that will invite discussion? I put this up again. We've seen this image before because another area that I've really been interested in um, and explored a lot is, is uh, working with string attractors and uh, chaotic dynamical systems. And I put this up again because we've talked a lot about um, you know root finding with polynomials. 
and uh, you know, finding the zeros, zeros of the polynomial. And while I'm not a mathematician, um, I know enough about this to say that there's a correspondence with, with fractals such as Mandelbrot, there's a correspondence with dynamical systems such as strange attractors, where we have this uh, Feigenbaum diagram that goes from kind of very predictable, ordered behavior, and then starts to do what they call a, or, uh, bifurcation, various points here. Bifurcates again, bifurcates again, and you'll, you'll notice, um, and, and tell me if this is right. Is it, This is the real line right here? This is the real axis? And then a complex? Um, so you'll see the correspondence visually with the Mandelbrot set, um, where you see the, the roots on the real line. And you'll see at this point, uh, everything kind of explodes into chaos. Um, so you get this very interesting behavior. This this is generated by a very simple equation um, that was was being explored, the logistic equation that was being explored um, to uh, try and do things like population simulation. Um, and as mathematicians explored this function, they started to see, oh, wow, there's, there's some really kind of unpredictability here. There's chaos coming out. And this is very interesting stuff. I put this up here. This is, you can actually, uh, program an oscilloscope in an analog fashion to generate the Feigenbaum diagram. It's just stuff like that is very interesting to me. When I talk about screen detractors and I try and uh, explain them to people, uh, I often start with talking about a pendulum. And if you imagine a pendulum swinging back and forth that's just a very simple pendulum that's based on our reality, uh, except instead of being just two-dimensional, imagine that you've got a weight on a string that's free to swing in three dimensions. And you give it a swing, and it's going to swing, and it's going to eventually settle down into a fixed point because of air friction, because of gravity, and because of those things. So that's uh, one type of orbit uh, that a, a dynamical system can settle into is a fixed point orbit. Um, another type of, of orbit that you can get is, is a, a, a periodic orbit. And I say, imagine um, a pendulum that's swinging in the same fashion, but there's no, uh, there's no friction, and there's no air, and so you can imagine that uh, if you swing it in a certain way, it's going to trace out the same pattern um, over and over and over again indefinitely. Um, then I say, imagine a, a pendulum that has magnets on the base, and the magnets have a different polarity facing up as the one on the bottom of the pendulum that's facing down, and you get uh, all sorts of uh, crazy chaotic motion, and you can actually map that out um, and see the probabilities of, of, of the pendulum swinging in any particular location based on those magnets. Um, this is the Lorenz attractor. Lorenz, um, as most of you probably know, uh, was exploring things like uh, atmospheric models. He was a mathematician and um, uh, meteorologist. That's probably not the right word. Um, I can't think of the right word. Anyway, he was studying, uh, he was trying to, to come up with some simple equations that would help uh, predict weather patterns. And uh, in the process, he kind of stumbled across uh, what's now known as the Lorenz attractor. And this is the representation. Um, this, is, this is one representation of the Lorenz attractor, which is nice because you can actually uh, you know, trace the, the path of the particle um, around the system uh, because you've got access to the differential equations there. Um, that's another rendering of the, of the Lorentz attractor with different uh, parameters that go into the equation. Now this is the, um, the computer science friendly, programmer friendly uh, version of the Lorentz attractor as a set of iterated functions. And uh, using this, this version of the attractor, you can plot a point in three-dimensional space and use that point, plug back into the equation, and do this hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of times, and get these types of images uh, in, a, in a way that's very friendly um, to programmers. And this is the kind of thing that I've been interested in um, and explored. So there's the Lorenz butterfly, and I'm all about the butterfly effect. And, um, it's kind of a, in our cultural consciousness now. All right, so another software demo here. This is, the, this is a fun one. All right, 
So we're, we're actually looking at right now uh, what, what they would call the pickover tracker. Um, there's a guy named Cliff Pickover, and he, he wrote a book called uh, Chaos in Wonderland that, that really was inspiring to me and uh, got me interested in this kind of stuff. And uh, if I rotate this, you'll see that, that even though it looks like this one has some depth, it's actually uh, just existing on a plane. Um, but the way that I've structured my software and the way that I like playing with it, I've basically got real-time access to coefficients um, that affect the system. So one of the things that I really enjoy about um, using math uh, to explore these things is that there's, a, there's an infinite possibility, and an infinite space of possibilities. And I really enjoy the, the process of uh, uh, exploration and discovery in this infinite space of, of kind of see myself as, a, as an explorer um, going through this space and, and, and carving out paths and uh, trying to find things that, that are already there because they exist within the, within the mathematical equations but are just kind of waiting to, to be discovered. So, just to point out more to you math and interesting math things, you'll, you'll see this would be kind of the example in the um, stranger tracker fixed point orbit. And uh, then you'll see fun things like you imagine that fighting bomb diagram in, in this space when it goes from this ordered behavior um, to a bifurcation to another bifurcation and eventually explodes out into chaos. It's kind of the same thing that's going on here. So these are pretty interesting things. I like sometimes just uh, kind of jamming on this stuff. Stick on some electronica and uh, just explore the, the aesthetic beauty of the, of the mathematical equation. It's really interesting when we start to get into um, three dimensions. Can I ask a brief question? Please do. What's the art object? Do you sell the computer program? I mean, from a marketing point of view. Well, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I, I've made most of the prints in the last um, five years or so, and I've not sold many of them. Uh, it's very difficult to sell uh, digital art prints. Yeah. Um, so I've recently spent more time on enhancing the experience of uh, of using and, and seeing the software. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, basically, I guess my, my next step for, for that is, is doing things like showing the, the society stick people in an art gallery context. Mm -hmm. And that's good for my artist resume. It's not so good for my pocketbook. So I do mm -hmm. other things like video game development and web design, graphic design, and that kind of stuff. I, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't call myself a natural uh, business person or marketer. And so, uh, yeah. I mean, something like this could almost be used in performance, where, again, Absolutely. the dancer is manipulating in real yeah. time. I, I actually have, it's interesting to say dancers, um, because there is a, there's a dance, contemporary dance group in Central Florida that I'm planning on mm -hmm. um, working with and, and attaching their performance to the Central Florida. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so there's. Lots of cool stuff to explore in there, but I, I know time flies, and I've got some other stuff I'd like to show you guys. All right, so in the, in the space of, of string tractors, you have four coefficients. And coming from an aesthetic or artistic point of view, I, I started to think, well, how can I um, how can I take a step back from this space? How can I uh, get to the next meta level and kind of understand what's going on here? Um, so I, I started to learn about the live cleanup exponent, which is a measure of how chaotic a system is uh, based on the specific coefficients uh, that are given. So 
if I uh, see a particular strain of tractor that's kind of thin and filamentous, um, its live pin of exponent is going to be smaller. It's, it's less chaotic. And the really cloudy ones are, are more chaotic. So because I have four coefficients, um, I've got what I'd like to think of as a four-dimensional parameter space. And um, the, the, the way that I decided to visualize this in this, this next series, which, which I call Faces of Chaos, um, is to create this grid of images, 1,024 images. And two of my coefficients vary from uh, left to right and, and bottom to top across the entire image. And the other two of my coefficients vary from left to right and bottom to top within individual images. In this way, I'm, I'm capturing some of the, the identity of the nature of these equations in an admittedly very uh, creative and loosely mathematic kind of way. These are some of the individual images that exist within that large piece that, I, that was up there a second ago. Large piece I call tiled faces. Uh, this is called Chinese warrior. Death Mask 2, Death Mask 1, and Owl King. And uh, just talk, talk a little bit about my, my creative process in getting to this point. Um, you know, I, I, I have the idea, I, I try and characterize the space, I start writing some code and I start rendering some images. Um, and I get thousands of images, and not all of them are interesting. And I'm, so I'm looking through these images, and I'm trying to think, how can I put them together? Um, you know, what is there? Is there really anything in here? And uh, I, I, I like to say I, I started seeing faces in the chaos because of the bilateral symmetry. Started to see this, you know, kind of pattern recognition, and started to pick out uh, these images that were more suggestive of of, 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 of characters or of, of faces. And some people have said these have kind of a uh, mythological quality. Um, they feel uh, almost archetypal. And, and subconsciously, I think that's something that was going on as I gave them names like Owl King and, and Chinese Warrior, things that are um, archetypes of you know, warriors and kings and uh, these kinds of uh, far-reaching, cross-cultural things, that uh, concepts, I guess, that exist um, within our physiology and with our, within our consciousness. Going back to the stick people, another experiment that I've done extending the stick people into the fourth dimension, where the fourth dimension is time, is to take um, what I would call a digital chronic photograph, uh, basically uh, allowing the lens of the virtual camera to remain open as the simulation progresses, and basically taking a virtual long exposure photograph of the simulation. In this way, I'm kind of mirroring this idea of trying to capture the, the nature of the system um, by, because every, every time the society of stick people runs, it's slightly different. So my question in this case, my conceptual question was, how can I capture the nature of this particular evolution of the society in one frame? And these are some of my results. Going back to the strange attractors, uh, this is some new work that I'm that I'm working on, taking the uh, three-dimensional strange attractors into uh, a, sy a, a system where I can actually simulate virtual light and create a shader that allows me to see both the uh, surface of the image and the interior structure. Because one of the interesting things about these strange attractors is that um, is that they have you know, they, ha they have an overall form, but they also have an internal form. And in, in the version of the program that I showed you where everything's running in real time, even the three-dimensional tractors kind of flatten out. Uh, and, and when I render them and, and print them out as prints, they kind of flatten out and don't really maintain uh, the sculptural sense of, of three dimensions. So in this work, I'm, I'm starting to pursue that sculptural quality uh, and trying to express that form and explore that form. 
And this is a, a rotation and, and disintegration of that form. How am I doing on time? Okay. All right, so this is, this is something that's very much work in progress. Um, kind of will give you a sense of my, the, the way that I jump from thing to thing in a, in a new, with a new idea. So what you see here is uh, kind of a low resolution in white of a strange attractor. And one thing that I really like to do with the pickover attractors that seems to be either hard or impossible is to take uh, a bounded area of the attractor and uh, be able to zoom into it with without losing, without having to compute all the points that exist outside of that bounded area. Okay, so the reason that's hard for the pickover tractor, whose forms I really like, is because it only exists as the iterated functions. It doesn't exist as uh, differential equations. So I don't know that there's really uh, something within the equations that would allow me to set the bounds, because every time through the iterated functions, I get a new point, seemingly randomly, in, in three-dimensional space. So, you know, from my limited understanding of mathematics and trying to explore this idea, I, I drew, basically drew a, a, a box from negative one to, to one in, in, the, in both axes here and started coloring the points based on um, where they come from. Because I can't really go backwards, but I can keep track of, okay, I plot a point here and the next point lands in the square that I'm interested in. So I started coloring uh, the attractor that way, and I started getting these interesting patterns uh, and, and wondering, is there something here? Am I onto something? Is there a way that I can, that I can use this uh, to, to, to kind of do what I want to be able to almost infinitely zoom into this fractal structure? And so I started getting these kinds of images. And basically, um, what I was what I was doing here with the outlines is um, taking the set of iterated functions and re recursing them uh, on themselves. So, so using you know x x prime equals you know the that particular equation, taking that and substituting it in for x, and then plotting um, what I what I didn't know at the time. I, I wasn't exactly sure what I was plotting. Um, so I, I just started kind of setting that to you know zero, setting that to one, seeing what would happen. This is another recursion in that kind of fashion. Uh, doing things with color, trying looking at these outlines, trying to figure what, out what was going on, kind of dancing around <coughs> these ideas. Um, and, and honestly, I can't fully remember all of the steps that it took to get from uh, point A to point B, but eventually what I realized was if I, if I took each of those uh, surfaces, X prime, Y prime, and Z prime, and plotted them in three-dimensional space and uh, intersected them with the plane, what I was seeing with those, with those oval types of shapes was the intersection of the plane with that surface. Uh, and the reason I, they, they were over, overlapping ovals is because you've got X prime, Y prime, and Z prime, and you've got these surfaces that are, that are overlapping and producing these patterns. Um, so here, here you see the, okay, I guess in this case I was, I was doing uh, just the two-dimensional version of the equations. So here's the, the iterated functions, x prime and y prime. Here's with one substitution, and here's with two substitutions. Um, and I, you know, I start to get these images. So basically what came out of this, um, I'm going to go to another demo here. So at some point I, I, I discovered that the shapes themselves were interesting and, and even though I didn't think I could solve my initial problem, I'd like to kind of take a rabbit trail and, and explore these shapes. So I created, I created this, um, 
pattern generator. And you, you basically what you're looking at is X prime and Y prime um, from above. And you're looking at the intersection of the plane with those two surfaces. Um, so I can change the, the location of the plane and where, where the intersections occur. I can move independently move each of the uh, surfaces. I can zoom in and out. And then where it gets really interesting is I can start uh, recursing those surfaces. And since I have, uh, I still have my four coefficients that go into these surfaces, I can start changing those as well. coefficients have changed, sometimes the uh, resulting pattern is uh, periodic and sometimes it's not. You can see. Sorry about that. The variety that I'm, that I'm getting here is pretty uh, fascinating. Okay, so black and white is, you know, it's okay. You start to get a sense of what the possibilities of this space are. Um, but eventually you want to start exploring things in color. And so I haven't, I haven't had a chance to do much of this, but uh, here's an example of one pattern um, rendered out from the pattern generator, brought into Illustrator, and, and kind of turned into a repeatable pattern. So that's where I'd like to end my talk. a specific notion of, of the, how those two intersect? Well, in the game of life, you have a grid and you have some rules, and then you see that grid, and then you apply the rules. Mm -hmm. And it either annihilates completely, or it uh, uh, stabilizes into some shape, or it stabilizes into a moving shape, and, and so on, depending upon the rules, and the rules depend upon what is happening in the neighborhood of a given cell. Right, right. So, of course, your setup is far more sophisticated and complicated, but I'm imagining stick figures, you know, they, they multiply if, if the environment is right. And yes, they yes. Die off if it's not. Yes, absolutely. The only global thing that I have going on is if the population reaches a certain point, um, for technical reasons, I introduce the flame and kill someone. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. You could, you could um, kind of keep track of the, of the population density have that be a factor in, in the development of the society, have that be a factor in the birth rate, um, in the longevity, in the way that the buildings are built. There's also, what I like about this kind of exploration is it's a, it's a sandbox for me, and uh, I can kind of go off in any one of a number of directions, depending on what I'm interested in exploring. Um, I think we have, we still have a question, and then we'll go back to you. So, a hundred years from now, someone is looking at one of your images, do you think someone will be analyzing it to determine if it's based on a hyperbola or a parabola or a catenary, <laughs> or will they be trying to reconstruct the equations in the um, how many, how, how many years from now? <laughs> I think how many years is the question, a couple hundred. Years. So the point is, is does it matter at all what the equations were in the end? Uh, it depends on the audience. I mean, to some of you it might matter. Uh, to most artists it probably won't matter. To me, it matters in as much as um, I enjoy the, the 
dynamic between the computer's uh, ability to to process um, and to uh, envision these things um, and the, the kind of push and pull between myself as the artist and the computer and who has control over what and kind of navigating that territory. John? Um, to follow up on his question about the game of life, people who play with cellular combat seem to be loath to do things in different levels at the same time, like introduce the notion of zeitgeist, uh, like we're all, we're all sure that we're going bankrupt right now, our 401k plans are worth half, and you know, no one's noticed that it costs half as much to buy anything, so nothing's changed in a way, but the zeitgeist is we're in trouble, you mm -hmm. know, I'm exaggerating, but you, do you have any of that sort of, these sort of, it, a strict adherence to a formal system? No, no, just uh, different levels of, of what you're, again, what you're calling the self, or what you're mm -hmm. calling the neighborhood, that there could be this sort of extended... Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. I, I've shown the stick people um, a little bit, and it's interesting to hear people, how, how, how the viewers respond to the piece. So I've had, I've had, um, I've had a, a woman come up to me and say that she saw herself as the mother of all of the stick people, uh, and so that that was her that was her kind of response to the piece and her positioning of the self with regard to the system. Um, some of my goals in uh, in using stick people versus using uh, realistic, you know, more more realistic figurations is that a stick person is is something that everyone can relate to as uh, as an actor in a system. Uh, it, it, it removes some of those barriers and those boundaries to identifying with the work. So, yeah, I would say I, I like to I like the idea that, that it's open, that people can identify with an individual stick person, uh, which was kind of the goal. If you come up and you and you press the key or the button that inserts somebody acting sustainably in the system, that's representing your choice as an individual within a larger construct that hopefully your actions will uh, affect you know the outcome of the society. Uh -huh. I'd just like to see some of your stick people holding hands. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you.